When scientists want to study a protein, often what we do is we get bacteria or other types of cells to make this protein for us. We can do this using a process called recombinant protein expression. So when I say recombinant, basically that just means we're taking DNA from one place and sticking it somewhere else. And so in this case, we're taking DNA that contains the instructions for making a protein that we're interested in, and we're putting it in a circular piece of DNA called vector plasmid. So a plasmid is a circular piece of DNA, and the vector, that just means it's like a vehicle for getting it into cells. And so we're going to use it as a vehicle for getting it into cells. And in our case, and in a lot of cases, you put them into bacterial cells because those bacteria are easy to work with and manipulate and will make a lot of protein for you for cheap. For you for cheap. Um, and so we put them in this little vector. We have an antibiotic resistance gene or other selection marker. So basically, we only are going to feed the bacteria that take in our plasmid. And therefore, we don't kind of pay the bacteria that aren't doing anything for us. And we give our bacteria a head leg up because in the presence of the antibiotic, the other bacteria aren't going to be able to survive, but they will, even though they're kind of a little weaker because they're going to be doing our bidding. But anyway, we stick the instructions for making our protein. So remember, go back to your molecular dogma. We've got the DNA gene that gets transcribed into the RNA. And then that RNA gets used by the ribosomes to make a protein. So if we take the gene for the protein or, well, it's actually technically we're going to put the cDNA for the protein. There's this um, complicating matter that in your genomic DNA, you have exons and introns. And this offers a lot of great opportunities to kind of like splice them together in different ways. So you're going to always going to remove the introns and piece together the exons, but you can imagine that you can actually kind of like remove this pink part and then have a brown white. So there's this thing called alternative splicing and all this really cool stuff. But the bottom line is that you kind of have to go, you get this mature messenger RNA which after you remove the introns and all that good stuff. And it's a copy of this messenger RNA, a DNA copy of it, complementary DNA or cDNA. That's what we actually go when we put in the plasmid and we put in, make get the bacteria to use to make our protein. But typically we just say we put the gene for making the protein in the bacteria, but it is the cDNA. And it might not even be like the cDNA that would just be for our protein, because we're, we're controlling what we put in the bacteria. So often what we're going to do is we're going to stick a little bit at the end of it. We're going to stick a little extra sequence onto the end. What we can do is do things like add a histidine tag. And so how do we add a histidine? Well, we add the code on the genetic, the RNA like letter code that tells the ribosome to put a histidine. And we don't just put one of those codons, we put like six or eight of them. And then the ribosome is going to add those histidines to the end of our protein. And this is going to allow it to serve as an affinity tag. So basically the histidines are going to bind to nickel that's bound to this resin on this bead. So we have this like nickel NTA. So the NTA is kind of just like this linkery thing that's gonna bind to the nickel. And then our protein, the histidines on our protein are binding to the nickel. We can then wash all the other stuff off and compete off our protein using aminazole, which is just the side chain of histidine. We have to use a lot more of the aminazole than of um, the protein. We have to use these high concentrations of aminazole because it doesn't have as high affinity as our tag because, well, our tag has this cool like chelating effect where it's able to kind of clamp down on the metal because you have so many histidines in a row. So this is a form of affinity chromatography. There are other forms of affinity chromatography such as strep, tag, um, strep tags and various forms like that. And we use this term elution when we talk about kind of like pushing the protein off or when the protein actually comes off of the column, that will be our elution. Whereas before that, when all that kind of like stuff was coming through, well, initially the stuff that comes through before you do washes is called your flow through. And then when you're doing the washes, you call that basically just the wash. And then you have, when your protein comes off, that'll be your elution. And affinity chromatography is just one type of chromatography. There's also ion exchange chromatography, where we separate things based on their charge, and size exclusion chromatography, where we separate things based on their size. We can do chromatography and gravity flow. So basically, you just let gravity do the job. Or they also have HFPLC machines. So fast protein liquid chromatography. Um, often these are called ACTAs. ACTAs is the brand name. And they are going to use pumps to pump flow things through, through your various columns. And so these are all strategies that you can use to purify a protein of interest. And 
Be Affinity one is the only one that actually like requires you to put something extra on your protein. The other ones can be also be used for like native protein purification. Well, I guess in some cases you can do affinity chromatography if you don't have like a tag, if your protein had some specific feature, like maybe it's a, that binds to a uh, specific like DNA DNA or something. And you can have like a co column that's coded in that, you know, like stick with that DNA sticking off of it or something. There are various forms of affinity chromatography that you don't actually need a tag. But these days, most times when we're doing affinity chromatography, it's because we're doing it with like, we're using a recombinant protein expression. And so since we're telling the bacteria what to make, we can tell them to add that little extra bit onto the end. And sometimes what we do is we actually add a sequence between the tag and the protein so that that has a recognition site for a protein, so a protein chewer. So, but in this case, a good protein chewer because it's going to cut just to that specific site, cut the tag off and let our protein go. But often we don't even cut the tag off if we're dealing with a small tag, something like a his tag, a strep tag, we might leave it on because it's not really gonna interfere with things and it's a pain to actually try to remove it. If you want a protein really, really pure, you're also going to go through like several purification steps in a row. So maybe you use the affinity chromatography step. So you want to start with that one because it's the most specific. If you think about it, not all those proteins are going to have his tags. Yes, they might have some um, histidines, but not like six or eight of them in a row. And so that's, well, we, and if we use this low amount of imidazole in our buffers, we're preventing that non-specific binding. And then we keep our protein stuck on until we add a lot of imidazole, and then we can push it off. So now we've used that specific feature though. So now you turn to other features about the protein, things like its charge and its size. We're only gonna do a single step purification because we don't need to be super duper pure. And we found that a single step of this histag purification is pretty good for our protein. And so we'll go with that. But then we're gonna use a technique called dialysis in which we're actually going to stick our protein in a little membrane pouch and the and allow kind of the imidazole to diffuse out because we don't want to all that imidazole around because, well, remember we had to put high concentrations of imidazole in order to push our protein off and that imidazole might interfere with things later on. And so we can use this dialysis method to, to get rid of it. Basically our protein is going to, we'll put it in a little pouch and the protein can't get out of the pouch, but the imidazole can. And so thanks to the fusion, if you put the, your protein in the pouch and a lot of the buffer that you wanted in the buffer in buffer without imidazole, all that imidazole will like go out. All the stuff in the buffer that you want will come in and the stuff in the buffer that you don't want will go out. And if you have a large enough excess volume, you'll get to a point where you reach the equilibrium and you have very, very, your protein is basically in the buffer that you want it to be in. But you also, you also might want to do that if you're moving on to like ion exchange chromatography because that imidazole would interfere with things. Um, side exclusion chromatography would get rid of it. But that requires you to use like a column and an acta and all this stuff. And so we're going simple. We're just going to use that his tag and then follow it up with dialysis. Of course, in order to actually go from the expression to the purification, you're going to have to break open the bacteria. So we're gonna use like lysozyme, which is an enzyme that's gonna help chop up the bacterial walls as well as sonification, which is gonna use ultrasonic sound waves to help break um, break the cells open and to break up the DNA within it because that can make it all goopy. Then we'll spin the cells down to separate out the membrane parts from the rest of the stuff that we want. So our protein is should be water soluble. So we're gonna basically be able to separate all that stuff out. And then we're gonna put that that lysate, the soluble portion of the insides of the cells onto the resin, let it bind, wash the other stuff off, and then compete our protein off. At the end of the day, we'll get our purified protein and voila, we can play with it. So first we're gonna want to check and make sure it's actually pure, which we can do using a technique called an SDS page gel which is going to unfold the protein and give it a nice negative charge, keep it soluble, send it traveling through a gel mesh. The bigger things get tangled up more, so they're gonna travel slower. The smaller things travel faster. And when you turn off the electricity that was driving the things through the gel, well, now what's gonna happen is if you stay in the gel, you're gonna see bands corresponding to the positions of the proteins. And you're hoping to see that you're going to see like one strong band corresponding to your protein. 
in the lane with your final with the final product. You are also going to go measure the concentration of the protein. So you can do that with like the UV using that extinction coefficient you can find with prop param, as well as using a Bradford assay. Hopefully all plays out okay. And now you've got your protein, you know what its concentration is. Now we can play. And although we're just going to be adding a histidine tag, we could, if we wanted to, also do things like introduce site-specific mutations to this protein um, to make changes to the protein and try to figure out how those affect the function. And that can help us kind of put together this relationship between the protein form and its function. We can also do things like just express or get cells to make a little portion of the protein, like maybe one of those domains, but not the whole protein. All sorts of cool stuff you can do thanks to this recombinant protein technology, including adding one of those histidine tags.